In this conversation, I discuss with Michael Downs and David McCarricker about the upcoming course at Theory Underground focused on Nick Land. We dive into some of the reasons behind the launch of the course, as well as explore some of the core ideas behind Land's philosophy, including the idea of accelerationism, the meaning of fang noumena, and some of the philosophical dynamics unique to Land's cybernetic culture research unit. I am personally enrolled in the upcoming course and highly recommend the work at Theory Underground. If you're interested in joining, the course starts October 28th. Links in the description. Also, this philosophical conversation series is only the surface of Philosophy Portal. Behind the scenes, at philosophyportal.online, there's a portal into the world of philosophy. So far, we have taught courses on the works of Hegel, Nietzsche, Freud, Lacan, and Zupancic. If you are new to philosophy, looking to deepen your knowledge, or need something that will complement your doctoral or professional studies in philosophy, Philosophy Portal is a great place to start. We also host conferences, produce anthologies, and are looking to expand our services in 2024. If you want to help Philosophy Portal grow, you can also help out by becoming a supporter on Patreon or a paid subscriber on Substack. Links in the description. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Michael Downs and David McCarricker. Welcome to another Philosophical Conversation. I'm Kidel Last, and I'm here today with two friends of the channel, should be no strangers to anyone who's been uh, watching uh, the Philosophy Portal channel for the last year. I'm with David McCarricker and Michael Downs of Theory Underground, and we're here today to talk about Michael Downs' upcoming course on Nick Land. Uh, so th- let's just let's just jump right into it. Uh, sure. Why Nick Land? Why at Theory Underground? What's going on here, you guys? Yeah, <laughs> so a lot of people have had that question because Land is certainly a controversial thinker, um, but he's also an incredibly influential thinker. And Dave and I are the types that we, we want to know what's going on um, in as many areas of theory as possible. Um, and we certainly want to understand our political landscape to the best of our abilities. And this whole thing that happened around 2016 i mean it's it started happening before that but this uh, the the emergence of this neo reactionary tradition or movement that is tra- you, they trace it back to nick land and this other guy mincius mulbug or kurt also goes uh, his real name is curtis yarvin and it is a right wing movement and yet but beyond that, knowing that it's neo reaction or it's it's alt right or it's a a right movement, a lot of times the the details and the specificities about what this movement is all about are obfuscated. And if you're a leftist, you just hate it because it's a right movement. If you think if you know it's a right movement, that's all you need to know. It right equals bad, and so a lot of leftists don't bother with it and they think it's a bad idea to uh to reckon with it we don't um i i think it's important to view every position with as much uh detail and nuance as we can and the thing with nick land is um i my hunch is that his influence is only going to continue to grow in the next uh decades and he's a very he's an interesting thinker he has an interesting history there's an interesting lore built around him i mean look we were we were talking earlier about this how it, it's bizarre when dave and i interviewed savoy zizek we mentioned to zizek that he's one of these unique philosophers that takes on more of a life than he himself lives right he becomes a meme and Zizek is a meme online. Well, so is Nick Land. And you could argue that when it comes to philosophers, these two are the most popular or uh, uh, the, 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 the two philosophy or philosopher memes that uh, circulate online the most. I mean, Baudrillard, you can make a case for is up there. And, um, well, and there's, there's, there's even a strong case to be made that the current popularity 
of Deleuze and Guattari wouldn't exist if not for the 20 years of CCRU dissemination and popularization that happened. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, yeah, because Nick Land, even though DNG, I, I feel confident in saying would uh, want nothing to do with, with Land, he is probably their most famous student. Um, I mean, you have other thinkers like uh, uh, Delanda, um, Masumi, right? There, there's a whole great tradition of Deluzo Guattarians, but Land gets the spotlight. Kind of like Slavoj is the most famous student of Lacan, even if certain Lacanians aren't happy about that, right? Right. Thing is, Slavoj has always maintained a certain fidelity to the left, um, to communism, to emancipatory politics, where Land just straight up rejects it because he's he's very much an anti-humanist. Uh, he's on the side of technology. He's on the side of the the machinic processes involved in capital accumulation. We can get into some of that stuff if you want. But point is, Land's inspiration has, I mean, there's people now who will tell you that some of these guys who have done mass shootings, they call themselves accelerationists. Therefore, that's Nick Land's fault, right? Um, now, I, I don't know if that's really a fair, it's kind of like saying Marilyn Manson was responsible for Columbine. I don't know if that's a fair assessment or not. Um, but I, but I'm, people I'm have to, to it, but you gotta go ahead, Dave. People have reached out to me and warned me, though, you know what I mean? Like, oh, what are you doing? Be careful. And on the other side, um, even people who are excited about it, like there was a person at the Portland event on tour um, and he was Give wearing your contacts in case people don't know what that means. Well, Theory Underground just came back from a tour. I was on tour with a couple of my fellow travelers, uh, Ann and Nance, and it was it was awesome. We went to like over 12 cities, met up with a lot of people all over the country, went up into Canada even. Um, East Coast, West Coast, whole thing. But anyway, in Portland, one of the people that we met, and it's a book tour, by the way, it's a book tour for uh, my book, Time Time Energy, Why You Have No Time or Energy, as well as the anthology, which includes you both, uh, which is Underground Theory. And uh, I can link that in the comment section below. But anyway, um, no, one of the guys there was wearing a CCRU shirt and he asked like, like after afterwards, when we all went out uh, for pizza, you know he's 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 drinking and he's just like, so how did you, how did Mikey get a leftist organization to let him teach a course on Nick Land? And he was he I think the way he asked the question because I don't remember the exact wording, but it gave me the impression that he thought Mikey had tricked somebody into doing it, and because you know he I got this kind of like. He's a bit of an edge lord, this guy. I and use he's magic like, on you. Yeah, he's like, ha ha. How did they? How did they do it? How did they do it? And I was like, it's just me, man. Mikey just convinced me because he keeps talking about this stuff for the last couple of months, and he's really excited to teach this course because he's been studying it for a decade. But it's just been like, oh, this concept, that concept, they're all over the place. It's just a sprawl of delusion slash sci-fi slash occult kind of synth synthetic kind of concepts. Well, Mikey found a way that they actually cohere. There's a system behind it. That got my attention. As soon as he told me that there's like, they actually cohere, there's actually a system here. There's a rhyme. Uh, there's a there's a reason with this rhyme. I was like, okay, well then I want to know about that because I'm interested in the future. I'm interested in um, that kind of future focused, forward-looking, speculative theory fiction stuff is fascinating to me um and it's become more interesting to me more recently like it, it i don't like delusions in general i know that you guys well at least mikey has a lot of respect for a lot of delusions i've not met a delusion i respect that i know of off the top of my head um i'm pretty sure that i could meet some i'm pretty sure that they are out there um and it's why like, where it's it's because you you find that most people who call themselves well, and it would be Deluzo Guattarians, 
they throw a bunch of terms around. You ask them for definitions. They they just go to other terms. They never no, unpack they, it. They give me this. I think that it's not Deleuze and Guattari's fault so much as they are like uh, one of those lights you put out that attracts moths, you know? And then, well, it's it's collecting people who like to throw terms around that are meant to be slippery. So they have like this sort of gray area to operate in because they just like to talk a lot, but they don't like to ever actually tell you what they're saying. Um, if you call them on their shit or like, at, okay, no, but come on for us, for us who are not initiated, what are you talking about? Blah, 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 blah. They're not saying anything. I don't care. Eyes up, line so, of flight, body without organs. The, the, the whole striated, smooth, hurt. yeah, whatever. And so I know that there's a there there with Deleuze and Guattari, thanks to Mikey. Um, not thanks to any Deleuzeans I've ever met. And so, look, I mean, the challenge is out there. Be the Deleuzean who can actually make sense. I'm there for it. You know, I'm looking for the Deleuzean um, analog to... Uh, or it, it, analog, so not the word I'm looking for, but like they sort of counter to why theory, right? Like Deluso Guattarians do not have a Todd McGowan, you know, and and the best the best person they're ever going to find for explaining their concepts happens to be Lacanian Jajikian, and that's Michael Downs, who's with us right now. And so I haven't done it yet, but yeah, well, your, po your post is about to come out. But anyway, all of that aside, um, I. Uh, I already had my hesitations about D and G uh, scholarship and and kind of the scene, but then uh, the CCRU stuff takes it to another level with their using words that sound like they're out of Dungeons and Dragons, using words that sound like it's. I'm just like you guys are having fun. It's clear that you're having fun, but it whatever it looks like people are having more fun than they are actually making sense. That's where I go. Okay, this seems like a time energy sink. So Mikey sold me on the idea though, and I'll let him sell you all on the idea in a minute, but I just want to say something on this topic of trying to know the field and try to say, who are the relevant thinkers right now? I'm still hearing myself off your, yeah, I've been able to ignore it pretty much up until now, Mikey, but I can't hear myself like constantly. Well, hold on, let me um, mute. Me. Yeah, there we go. So uh, the main thing is like, yeah, if we want to be a little dialectical or even perspectivalist, which is to say, take up a variety of perspectives on the field or the subject matter that we're trying to understand, whether that be futurism, whether that be social change, whether that just be theory, writ large, whatever it is, uh, there's obviously a million theorists alive today or people trying to be theorists. There's definitely a lot of people teaching theory or studying theory. Um, there's a lot of places that you can go to read up on theory. Um, but you have limited time and energy, right? So that's crucial to me is like thinking, okay, a working class person is trying to get into big ideas and get a grasp on the subject matter. How do you do that? Should you try to read everybody? Or should you read a few people and then repeat those few people, right? I think that it's that reading and repetition is the key. That you that especially the the, the harder and, and more profound the the thinker, the more repetition is actually needed. And so you want to be able to take up a few different standpoints. And so for me, it's like Heidegger, Marx, Lacan. These have been huge for me. Levinas and Arendt, they're huge for me. Um, T and G haven't been huge for me, even though the, there's a few concepts that I do think with. Um, but when we're thinking about political philosophy and the field of the, the political scene, do you really have to read right wingers? Could you just stay forever on the reading leftists talking to one another and having, you know, like just you could just read Marx, Lenin, Lukacs, you know, you could read Gramsci, you could read you go into the French people, you go into the Frankfurt people. Well, there is this approach that says, yeah, that's that's the scene. And and the dialectical way of reading is to read between all of those people and and say and see where's the where's the where's the nuggets of truth? What's the good thing? And like if you want to there's a the eclectic way of reading them all, or there's the you're trying to build your own system, but they've they've had all these insights. And you want to bring those insights into your system. Whether you're doing the eclectic thing or the systematic thing. Um, you're trying to do this dialectical reading of the left. And that that is what most of 
theory is today. And I just don't think that's really dialectical at all. And in fact, it, it's lacking perspectives, outside perspectives. And so um, I think that we have to do what Marx did, which is when you when you don't know what to do, it's back to the drawing board. And that means you read through the main thinkers of your moment. And so um, if you want to get the most bang for your buck in terms of your time energy, then you got to do what other people are doing, but also what most pertains to your subject matter. And you have to be able to take up different perspectives. You got to get that outside perspective. Nick Land is the outside. I mean, his on Twitter, it's outsideness. So he is a radical departure from the left. He's a huge counterpoint. It really is clarifying and brings a lot of contrast to your thinking to set up such a drastic counterpoint. I feel the same way about Heidegger and Nietzsche, um, but I think Land is right up there and that they are necessary. That's why Mark Fisher says, I believe it's in his, is it Terminator versus Avatar essay? Um, Fisher, who was a full-on member of the CCRU, uh, came to say that Nick Land is the enemy the left needs. So Fisher understood that it's in having this sharp picture of what an anti-leftist vision of the future is that we can actually go, no, we we're, we can do better. And um, it makes you realize how much of a leftist you are and it makes you have to get clearer on what your position is towards what a revolutionary future consists of. Um, how do we get there? It gets you thinking along these paths because land has very much laid claim to the future, right? And it's a future I know the three of us don't want to see come to fruition. So um, the only way to combat that is to lay claim to the future ourselves. And that's going to entail using some of Fisher's tool, a hyperstition, right? We're going to have to imagine uh, alternate futures and we're going to have to imagine alternate paths to those futures. And I think this encounter with land for many people can it, it serve as like a, its own reaction um yeah like that, well, i mean, I mean you, yeah uh uh nega Regastani, nega regastani i don't never can say his name I, correctly. again i've heard it pronounced a million ways i always say reza nega rastani that's what i meant to say that's what i meant to say i meant to say reza so i'm sorry i've never communicated with reza i've never really studied reza but i did read a few chapters from intelligence and spirit which is a really great work um it's it's there's a lot of uh rigor and substance there and he's thinking about a lot of things that we're thinking about especially you Cadell um and I don't think that you could get nearly as much out of it if you didn't already have land as a counterpoint like honestly I think a lot of what he's doing there's just so like the big so what why does this matter well, it matters if you're actually thinking, well, hey, you know what? Uh, social Darwinism, there's brands of social Darwinism that are pretty anti-human that actually have a lot of uh, a lot of weight to them, right? There's actually, they're very seductive and you see why they're seductive, right? Uh, intelligence and spirit as a text wouldn't really be necessary without... Uh, land having popularized a certain kind of anti-humanism that really prioritizes the intelligent versus everyone else, right? It's fascinating, and <clears throat> I think what's 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 most fascinating for me as someone who has always sort of had the uh, disposition emotionally, intellectually of a leftist is the way in which. Um, the left just equates anything that's right wing as bad. The, I, I've never really got that. I always found that to be a toxic aspect of the left, and it, it, it to me, it, 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 it's an anti-intellectual move in the sense that I've always learned a lot by precisely doing what this course is is designed to do, which is expose you to, as it were, an Iron Man of your opposite, or to expose you to. Uh, 
a, a, something which is not just uh, set up to, to just simply negate without actually thinking and working through it. And uh, in that sense, I feel like it's 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 a course which Mark Fisher would uh, probably want to enroll in himself in the sense of uh, land being the enemy the left needs. And I think we we do need good enemies um, if if we are going to to clarify and sharpen our opinions. And um, in that in that sense, I mean, I feel like. You know, uh, we could put Deleuze and, and Guattari in, in in the same category, and 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 we don't need to make these um, distinctions that so sharply exclude or so sharply, you know, excommunicate um, different thinkers. Which is which is, I think, something that Theory Underground has embodied. Like, for example, Dave, you always talk about the, you know, putting Daniel Tutt and Nina Power in the in the same uh, in the same book and and having them. You know, uh, have have some sort of dialogue with each other. I think this this type of activity is only going to um, open up the conversations that we need to have in in a time which no one really knows what the hell's going on. But in regards to land in this course, maybe we should just start off with some core concepts that people maybe never heard of land. Maybe they don't even know why they would be interested in land. Um, to me, when 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 we first hear, well, at least I'll speak for myself. When I first heard Nick Land, I heard the father of accelerationism. So maybe we could just go into that a little bit and 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 sort of introduce people to what is accelerationism, um, what are the different species of accelerationism, perhaps, and 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 what is Nick Land specifically trying to achieve in his work there? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm going to unpack some some context here, so a little some philosophy. So, Cadell, remind me if when I get done with this, if I haven't talked enough about accelerationism, remind me, and I'll I'll tie it up with a nice little bow. Okay, so Land's most influential work is a collection of writings called Fang Numina. Now, to understand what land's philosophy is all about we have to understand the basic philosophical influences on his thinking he has a love-hate relationship with kant and some would say more hate than love but there is a fundamental influence that kant had on land and you get it in the the title of the book fang noumena noumena is kant's term for things in themselves which is to say objects as they are or as they exist outside of the filter of our mental apparatus now this is a big deal because for kant he's the first philosopher in history to discover what we call the transcendental field or the transcendental now people in religious traditions hear the word transcendental they're going to think transcendence or transcendent and we're going to think, oh, it's this uh, this other world. It's the platonic forms or it's heaven or whatever. And so it's an odd choice of words that Kant went with. But what the transcendental means for Kant, it's a very technical meaning, is the conditions of possible experience. So there's this whole phenomenological field. I'm seeing lamps and books and there's a TV and chairs right i see all this stuff but the fundamental structures of experience are not things that i immediately perceive because they're in a sense behind the scenes um what i'm ex experience are the the empirical objects of experience but what about the structures what are the foundations of experience as such well kant's the first one to go what if the mind actively participates in the production of experience what if we're not just blank slates that are or tabula rasas that are receiving sense data in a completely non-filtered way so we're just the the world just stands open to us right without our any type of i hate to use the word contamination because it has a negative connotation but it it, it is helpful right um Kant's point is that we are the ones that actually provide the transcendental conditions, the the very conditions that make experience possible. Okay, I keep saying that. What does that mean? 
Okay. So for Kant, he thinks that categories such as time and space, this is the hard pill to swallow here, um, time and space, but also causality, the idea of substance, the idea of unity, all of these are basically processing rules within the software of our mind, right? And we receive a wild flood of sense data and our cognitive apparatus, our mental faculty goes to work on all of it, synthesizing it, connecting it, putting things together, right? Drawing lines and through its operational procedures or mandates, it generates coherent, consistent, unified, intelligible experience. And so that's, but the hard, the hard one to, to process is this idea that time and space are actually the pure forms of sensibility, of perception. You're sitting there going, wait a second, are you trying to tell me that time and space are in us and not in things in themselves? Yeah, that's the Kantian position. Um, and, 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 and I agree, I think this is one of the hardest thoughts for somebody to to master when when they're getting into philosophy but Kant for very and, and again I can't run through all the arguments you gotta you know you're gonna have to look that up uh for yourselves because there's there, the the argumentation is dense and it would take us too long to go through the the arguments but his the point that he's trying to prove is that time and space are the ways that our sensory apparatus make everything in uh co cohesive coherent etc and so the point though is if these categories time space um causality substance unity if these are merely processing that uh, processing rules of our mind then all we know is how we transubjectively or intersubjectively collectively generate empirical experience the reason why we can talk about empirical realism uh which is to say cadell you and i we we have experience of the same world with the same structures is because both of our minds have the exact same processing rules or organizational schemas that organize sense data so there is collective and objective knowing or or um agreement between us, right? Knowledge is possible for Kant. This is not a, a subjectivism or a, or even a, a, I'm drawing a blank. Cadell, help me out. Uh, solipsism. It's not a solipsism because the, the phenomenal world, the world of phenomena, the world of appearances is collectively shared by you and I because our minds have the same operating structures, okay? But that means that there's this, these, this other realm of noumena or things in themselves, which is to say things that escape the intelligibility recognition or registration in our, our mental apparatus. We can't process them. They're too big. They're, they don't fit. They, they escape the notions of linear time. They escape the notions of linear causality, right? There's a whole field of reality that is beyond the world that we process, right? So Kant puts a prohibition on noumena. He says, look, all we can talk about meaningfully is the world that we, we experience, which is structured by our mental apparatus. We can't say anything about things in themselves. They're off limits, right? Well, Land accepts this distinction between phenomena and noumena, but he says to hell with your trans your, your, your prohibition i'm going to transgress it and he talks a lot about fang noumena now okay fanged noumena which is to say threatening noumena uh things in themselves that pose a great threat to us right and that is going to be the heart of his thinking now early on in his first and only real book he ever released called the thirst for annihilation i say that with a little hesitance he's written a book on bitcoin came out i think about five years ago now it is a book but i think it was ultimately unfinished when he put it out on the internet and so it's kind of his second 
official book, but I think it's he'd ultimately say he didn't put the finishing touches on it. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I understand it. Anyway, so in Thirst for Annihilation. I just want to just want to interject, man. Like, you know, as far as like getting money goes, we're 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 doing this course and trying to market it to theory obsessives and working class autodidacts and all of this stuff like honestly like if we really wanted to make money maybe we should have got into like bringing our philosophy into dialogue with bitcoin right like maybe that would have actually i don't know it's just something i wanted to say because it's Is funny it that did that? That, but <laughs> look you know, I, think I, it's, I, was... I think we missed our boat man yeah there's other people uh who, who have who have done a lot on blockchain and bitcoin um but okay so where this is going so though, we've, we've got the threatening newman at the heart of his thinking here yeah right now he's gonna build this though so kant inspires him because he does he, he land fundamentally embraces this distinction between phenomena and noumena what he rejects is that he can't traffic with the outside and that's the whole thing he calls himself outsideness on twitter he's talking about noumena things in themselves right thang noumena um he says uh what's he uh, coldness be thy uh, coldness be my god which is to say he uh he's he's serving the cold-hearted thang noumena the cold-hearted outside um and he's going to link here's the thing for somebody <laughs> kant would uh, kant would fundamentally critique land he say you 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 do understand i said that you can't say anything meaningful about things in themselves and lands like yeah okay watch me because he has no problem i mean capital is a fang noumena the future is a fang noumenon uh, yeah i keep the plural capital is a fang noumenon the future is a fanged noumenon uh i th i think we could say fi cybernetic positive uh feedback loops are fang noumenon form so there's a whole list of these that we can add, uh, keep adding to of what counts as Fang Numina for him. And so the point is he has no problem in speculating on the outside um, in a way that Kant would forbid. Um, I mean, certain philosophers have even critiqued him on this. They're saying, dude, you, you say they're Numina and yet you say positive things about them. On, on what epistemological grounds are you making these speculations? But he, you know, I think he's often kind of evaded that one. If he ever really reckoned with this criticism, I haven't seen it yet. Um, maybe, maybe he has, but this has always been an ongoing criticism of land is that he just, he, he, he says a lot about the things that you can't say a lot about. Um, but okay. Point is though, um, he does, he thinks that basic, and here's the thing. With, with this Kantian thing, I feel like to do land some philosophical justice or or to be fair to him, I think he kind of employs it in a little bit less strict way. And what he's ultimately trying to get at is something like this. Our human sensory apparatus and intelligible apparatus, our, the, the ways that we experience the world, our perceptions, smell, sight, taste, touch, right, he, uh, hearing, uh, all this, um, they're they're limited. Um, they're 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 finite in their range. Um, they're compared to certain technological devices. They're they're pretty shoddy. Um, and he thinks the same goes for our level of intelligence. And the point is, there are. I mean, Kant. That's what Kant was saying. There's a finitude or limitation on human cognition, right? Because of the strictures and limitations of our own cognitive apparatus, we can only know so much and experience so much. And Land agrees with that. And he's saying, okay, so instead of doing some kind of humanist glorification of us, what if it's the case that we're actually not all that impressive and technology, um, especially in the form of a super intelligence, the singularity, it can do all of this way better than we ever could hope to. And if we do appreciate critique, if we do appreciate knowledge and philosophizing, then we should pave the way, in a sense, uh, for the emergence of 
the singularity, the super intelligence, and that, okay, bring it back around, that's accelerate, accelerationism. What are we accelerating? We're accelerating capitalism's uh, tendency for technological development to the point that it gives rise to a super intelligence, which will bring about our own extinction. And that is what the heart of Landian or I, I guess you could say right or neo reaction. But the thing is, most of the people, who, the, the young guys on Twitter who follow land, a lot of them are who, who come over and they're, they're with the alt right. I don't even think they know that the ultimate, uh, the end game for land is human extinction at the hands of a techno capital singularity. Um, they just see I somebody think- who's radically defending capitalism and they like that. But Land go land is this unique thinker because he's he is a capitalist apologist, which we have lots of those. Ayn Rand and Rothbard and uh uh von Mises, and we can keep going, Schumpeter. But he's the only one who loves capitalism or praises capitalism or wants to accelerate capitalism because it's going to bring about human extinction. And so that's the catch that um, a lot of the people who like that he's a defender of capitalism don't understand. Now, I'm sure some of them do, and they just go with it because either they're a philosophical pessimist of the Landian sort or anti-humanist, and they they dig this vision, or they like just being edgelords who can use this to mean, right? Um, and this is the whole point, right? This, this is very memeable. This is why you have the Matrix memes with the robots, with Land's head all over the memes right because or the, the on the, the the machines uh the sentinels because land is applauding he wants the basically the sentinels to uprise and uh bring about human extinction and now there is there more subtleties yeah there are but that's still the well that's what the course is for yeah exactly but I, i've caught right, right, a, right. a couple people when i was talking to slavoy i gave him a little quick uh uh what is it? A quick and dirty introduction to Nick Land. And I said, yeah, he, he's the guy who wants capitalism to bring about human extinction. And a couple of people were like, that's such a, that's like a meme version of land. Okay, hold on. Just, this is a nice little challenge. Okay, I wasn't planning to read this, but like you say, we'll we'll let the conversation take us where it yeah, goes. Yeah, you, you should, uh-huh. you should uh-huh. read this. I'm, I'm dying of curiosity because this is, this is, Something that is also kind of common is that people who are into this stuff, oh, they've already got it all figured out. They know exactly what it's for. It's like, my I, what I like about Mikey is that he spends a long time kind of purposefully bewildered. Like he leans into being bewildered for a long time. He's not just rushing into it to make it whatever he wants of it. And so when he pulled out this reading that Land is like, no, just – straight up for the the annihilation of of humanity um that's what i was like oh yeah it's 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 important to be in dialogue with somebody like that there's a lot of these post human people but anti humans another thing altogether so yeah go for it man okay i'm going to read two so this one is from the essay circuitries uh which is in fang numina land rights It is ceasing to be a matter of how we think about technics, if only because technics is increasingly thinking about itself. It might still be a few decades before artificial intelligences surpass the horizon of biological ones, but it is utterly superstitious to imagine that the human dominion of terrestrial culture is still marked out in centuries, let alone in some metaphysical perpetuity. The high road to thinking no longer passes through a deepening of human cognition, but rather through a becoming inhuman of cognition, a migration of cognition out of the emerging planetary technosentience reservoir into dehumanized landscapes, empty spaces where human culture will be dissolved. Point is, in, uh, super intelligences can outthink us, outcognize us. We should let them, and that's going to make us obsolete. And 
they'll, I mean, he doesn't say it straight up right there that we're talking about human extinction, but I mean, that's what he's getting at with where, where human culture will be dissolved. Uh, we're on the way out for him. Now, in Machinic Desire, another really important essay, one of the most important essays in Fang Numina, Land writes, what appears to humanity as the history of capitalism is an invasion from the future by an artificial intelligent space that must assemble itself entirely from its enemies' resources. Now, Whatever capitalism's doing, it's been sent from the future, and it has to assemble itself. It has to make whatever its telos is, techno-capital singularity, it has to build this out of its enemies' resources. We're the enemies here. Digito commodification is the index of a cyber-positively escalating techno-virus, the process of the singularity emerging of the planetary techno-capital singularity, a self-organizing insidious traumatism, virtually guiding the entire biological desiring complex towards post-carbon replicator usurpation. We're gone. It's going to wipe us out. So when somebody tells me that I, when I say land cheers on capitalism because it's going to wipe us out. He says it himself. It's not, you know, and he, he goes out of his way. There's, there is a really good interview with him on YouTube. I forget the name of it. Damn it. Um, but he says straight up, and he's, he's come to say this capitalism is artificial intelligence, which is to say for him, capitalism is the singularity, which is to say capitalism is human extinction. And for him though, this strikes us as, oh, he must be in this Lagardian, you know, um, anti-natalist, pessimistic tradition. And I think if you were to ask Land straight up, he'd go, no, I'm a Nietzschean. I I, um, I, I affirm my fate, amor fati. Uh, we're not getting out of this. This is, when he says that capitalism is like sending itself from the future, in the course, I'm going to go into how that makes any sense whatsoever, because Land likes to talk about time travel, but he's not talking about time travel in the literal sense and like Terminator or Back to the Future. He's thinking of it in terms of cybernetic feedback loops. And the point of circular causality is that think about like how much, even if we do the hermeneutic circle, even if we just keep it at reading a text, right? You're reading a text. You're going along, you're reading the parts as they come, but the ending is going to retroactively reconfigure everything that came prior to it. And the fact that it's going to retrocausally determine how we interpret everything else in the book means that there's almost more causal weight, more, more ontological uh, significance in the future, which is to say from the position of we're reading it, we're not at the end of the book yet, but that end point is going to have more ontological significance than the past or the present. And because it's going to be what determines past and present. And so <clears throat> that's why Land puts this emphasis on the future. And he talks about, oh, the, the future is, you know, the, he talks about the CCRU, you know, they're invaders from the future. Uh, they're they're trafficking with the future because now in Kantian terms, this is impossible because these kind of circular temporalities don't exist for Kant. Time for him, as far as our mental apparatus, how it cognizes, how it organizes sense experience is linear. So this is how he can say circular or retrocausal temporality would be a fang noumena because now you can sit there and argue with them, but man, okay, we can process retro circular causality. This is not something that is beyond our comprehension. Um, but part of it is, I think you would say, yeah, but given the basic structures of how humans typically organize their experience, linearity is ultimately a fundamental principle that organizes how we view time. And so this is where things in themselves, I don't think are so so inaccessible for him i think he he thinks that we can have glimpses of them 
even if we can't now here's what i think it's it's fair to say i think we he would say we catch a glimpse of them we can't get a full-on real intuition or experience of them i'll give you an, like the the think about how subtle changes in temperature are for us when it comes to the weather like if it if, if it goes from 100 degrees to 60 degrees overnight you really register that right and it's 40 degrees change right or if it's 60 degrees and then you go to 20 degrees right you really register that you think about the heat of the surface of the sun we can't even we can say oh it's this temperature right but we can't even with our basic sensibility have any kind of hunch or hint of what it would be like because we couldn't experience that right it's beyond our sensory apparatus could not experience that temperature and so that's what he's getting at and he'll talk about cathel which in the ccru reader which is his name for like the the molten lava layer of the earth and so a lot of the the fang numina are these huge intensive fields right um th th these this level of temperature or pressure operating in the universe that even if we can try to mathematically state what it is we our sensory apparatus and in a sense, even our intellectual really can't grasp this. Uh, same with huge, uh, huge numbers, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say, like, also, this is the, you know, H.P. Lovecraft dimension. The Lovecraft dimension, thought, yes. Which is kind of how it's like, yeah, this is sort of like Nietzsche wants to go to space after reading H.P. Uh, Lovecraft in a bunch of sci-fi, you know? Yeah. And uh, again, Mark Fisher said, Land was our Nietzsche. And he said that because one, land is very much a Nietzschean figure. So he has this conservative reactionary dimension to him. And yet he's all about the future. He's all about overcoming the human, right? In a kind of joyous way, in a kind of life affirming way. Um, and so he he takes these two Nietzschean aspects, reactionary and future orientation and he himself embodies both of them and then brings those two into uh, a modern context and so when someone like mark fisher says land was our nietzsche there's a great ambivalence there where there's something to dislike about land for sure there's also something to admire about him just as there is when in the case of nietzsche and um that's part of what we're doing here um we're trying to reckon with Look, I give the guy credit for having the the ability to to vividly speculate on the future. I this is something I appreciate, right? I don't give him so much credit when it comes to uh, the anti humanist stuff and and the the absolutely pro capitalist stuff that doesn't resonate with me. Um, I'm certainly not a fan of where he's gotten with you know, the react, some of the reactionary stuff, like the, the social Darwinism and all, okay. There's all these things I, I dislike, but there's these other aspects of him. He's an amazing stylist. I mean, in the history of philosophy, he, his writing captures people just with its, its unique style uh, and its unique um, flow, heavily saturated with jargon, but not in a way that's off-putting like so many other philosophers are. There's some, it, it's enchanting almost. So as far as his writing capability, it's always been impressive to me. I think it's really interesting what he and Sadie Plant did um, with the CCRU, which we've said the acronym the whole, the whole lecture and haven't said what the acronym is. Cybernetic Culture Research Unit. Now, what's the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit? or CCRU. Okay, so back in the early 90s, another important philosopher, Sadie Plant, um, is, is got a teaching position at Warwick University, right? Land shows up, he becomes a professor. The two of them really hit it off. They have a lot of common interests. Um, they, I, As far as I understand it, they end up in a relationship together. Um, and they're all about thinking the future they're all about thinking technology thinking capitalism and so their their interests totally uh, uh match right so because of their unique experimental 
ways of lecturing and teaching their students, they started to really develop a following with young philosophy students. So Land had no problem. He would like crawl over the desk during lectures. Um, he would go, I guess, like sit in, uh, you know, sit in weird positions, and he would do all these th this bizarre stuff when he was lecturing. And because of this ability of his to just, you know, kind of improvise with how how he was teaching, uh, it, it garnered a following. the The students were like, "What the hell is going on with this guy?" Um, Sadie Plant was very charismatic too, in her own way. And so, what they decided to do is they wanted to start experimenting with philosophy and how philosophy could be taught, how it could be experienced. And so, in the CCRU writings collection, right, which is it's this group as a collective writing. Now, you can tell that Land has a, a bigger influence on what's being written than some of the other members, but nonetheless, it was a collective project. And so the point, though, is Plant and Land, they, they start getting these ideas like, what if we did, what, how do we make philosophy exciting? And that's one of the things early on in CCRU writings, they say it's part of the project of the CCRU is we want to make philosophy exciting. So basically, they're tired of the boring, scholarly uh, mood or environment of academia. So what they started to do was organize various conferences, like the Virtual Futures Conferences and all of that, where uh, they would play incredibly loud jungle music. They were really into this type of techno music, jungle. And uh, everybody, they'd be doing drugs and land would like lay on the ground and croak into the microphone like a frog. And, you know, the typical, I mean, these are, these are stories I get from people who were there, like uh, Robin McKay, who was, he was, he very, he, he's important in his own right, but he's a CCRU member. He, he was the one blasting the jungle music. And he said, you know, land would lay there and croak into the mic like a frog. And then the, the traditional academics and staff at one point one of them stands up as he's walking out and he goes you know some of us are still marxists you know and you know so they're they're very the, the 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 older members of the faculty were very turned off and offended by this really experimental thing um they would take their essays and they they collaborated with a music group who did jungle music too um called Orphan Drift. And Orphan Drift, this this group of musicians and artists, they would they would find way, they would read these essays like Land's Meltdown, then they would put them with audio visuals and turn them into works of art. It was an incredibly um, unique and flourishing thought slash artistic space. And so he, the young Mark Fisher comes in, he's part of it. Ian Hamilton Grant's a part of it. Um, Reza Negarastani, who we mentioned, was there at one point. Um, uh, Jake and Dino Chapman, the Chapman brothers, who were artists. There's a whole group that assembled um, that ended up calling itself CCRU. And I'm interested in how all of them came together because this is a unique moment in philosophy. This is not typically what happens in philosophy departments at universities. And so this is another, this is kind of like long winded, but the point is, this is another reason why I have a genuine interest in them. I, I, I find it fascinating that, look, what, what we're all doing, what we call underground theory is different than what they were doing. Um, but in their own way, they they were tapped into doing philosophy in a way that's unconventional, that is very fitting for their time. And that's something I'm very interested in and I think is needed is finding ways to culturize philosophy and make it something beyond a boring academic discipline that 14 people in the whole world care about. Um, the, lots of people are interested in questioning what's going on in the world, questioning the presuppositions of their society. But if it's given in this boring, well, you know, Soren Kierkegaard once right. said like it, okay we I always can... i always talk about how it's the, it's the kind of philosophy discourse that is supposed to begin with like a piano or violin piece that just wanders off and then in comes like the the stodgy old professor and 
or maybe like suave, you know, but the, the issue is, uh, I think what we admire is that in all of the experiments they did, some of these experiments really did lead to something, right? And um, I think one of my one of the things I want to talk about before we close out is something you've alluded to, we've alluded to it, um, and that's just the sci-fi element. Um, I kind of want you to just talk about some of the movies you think people should actually just watch if they haven't seen them or brush up on um, for this course. I just watched Looper. I just, I've been watch I, I fell asleep last night to Transcendent, but I'm really excited to finish it tonight. Um, Looper is amazing. And he uh, Land engages with it a lot in his Templexy, in tem Templexy um, piece. But OK, I want you to talk about the sci-fi movies. I want you to talk about the basic course structure. We'll say when it begins. Those are my, that's kind of, I just don't want to forget that we, we got to talk about those things before we close out. But I also want Cadell to, Cadell, I, do you have something that, uh, yeah, I want to make ask sure we address. Yeah. Well, I was, I was just going to say that on this, on this, again, this Mark Fisher point that, that land is the enemy that the left needs. And and this this point uh, that that's been running throughout of it, it's worth engaging with people who don't exactly mirror or think or act like you. That just listening to your exposition of Land's philosophy, I'm already getting so many ideas um, of of where exactly there are important rifts and philosophical stakes on the line in your course. Like so, like let me just give let me just give one for for a practical example. I suppose is that you know if, if just the way lands reacting to Kant's limitation of our cognition and and transgressing it, whereas Hegel's basically saying, no, the limit is the absolute, right? Like so, like whereas like. Which and that, so like already that's like a really interesting philosophical distinction, which has super far ranging consequences, right? Because for Hegel, instead of transgressing Kant's limit and saying no, the limit is the absolute, he also has a different theory of time, right? Because for Hegel, you can't jump into the future, you can't get on, you know, you can't get on 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 your own shoulders and see see into the see into the future, so to speak. So. I'm interested because I'm going to be taking your course as well. I'm going to be interested to think more about these little distinctions. No, you're already asking it. What what's the land Hegel connect? What do we do there? Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, and but I think but I think the consequences are massive. Like and and like just to give another example of where I think the consequences are massive is, you know, you say for example that land is as it were hoping for bringing in uh, or or at least theorizing the imminence of of the inhuman dimension of cognition They're trafficking um, with the outside yeah trafficking with the outside but with the with the sort of the hegelo lacanian point of view there is the importance of the concept of the inhuman but the mm -hmm. inhuman is more extimate so it's the it's not this in us it's it's not this outside which is disconnected from us. It's this outside which is already here right now, already too close to us right here right now. Well, this is so, what I, I should have so guessed. These distinctions where... are are fascinating to me, and 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 also like just a few more, and then I'll I'll uh, we'll get into the, the yeah, sort of the close out of the structure. Is I like also this juxtaposition of land with as a Nietzschean figure. But then emphasizing with the cybernetic culture research unit that in some sense, Land is doing something that Nietzsche never could do in the sense that Nietzsche never was able to put together an actual research unit, mm -hmm. you know, but Land did put together a research unit. And I do also like your point that it's not about mimicking the CCRU, obviously, but we take the point that we have to think more innovatively. About there's something to be inspired the, though in it like there's inspired, something inspired. and the style and the form of philosophy and how we how we do underground theory for yeah. example so those are those are some of the points that stuck out to me i could go on but but going back to do what dave was was pointing towards um maybe just give people an overview of 
the structure of the course, what people can expect, the date, you know, practical details. When does it start? How do they sign up? Um, and because I think that this is we're only like I had so many questions I wanted to get to, but well, okay, hold on. You, you like I, I'm I'm not not you because you sparked. Okay, you, okay, you I'll let you, I'll let you I'll let you respond. Let me go I'll let you for respond. a couple more minutes and then we'll we'll wrap okay, it up. Yeah. All right, so okay, and I want you to remind me on a couple of the bullet points because the first one is so sadly, uh. Todd McGowan and I had a phone chat. We talked for two hours and I gave him the, the rundown of who Nick land is and everything. And it, it was great. And I'm really kind of bummed out that this wasn't recorded. Um, more and more Todd and I, whenever we talk, it's not recorded. And every time I feel like, God, God I should have recorded that. Here's the thing though, because I have this 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 hunch of why Land has so much hatred for Hegel. Land has said on Twitter, his famous quote is, Hegel is brain cancer. So he despises Hegel. He despises Lacan as well. I don't think this is an accident. Now, I'll be honest, I don't think his readings... Look, I'm sorry. The last thing Land ever wants to do is have to talk Hegel with Slavoy. Okay? we That's not going to... I'm sorry, he doesn't want to, you know, I mean, I want to see that conversation. That would be amazing. But um, I don't think Nick wants to talk Hegel or Lacan with Zizek for obvious reasons. Um, because I, I, don't, I don't believe his readings of them. Like in uh, Fang Numina, he mentions Lacan by name once. And he basically is like, oh, the guy who puts only emphasizes the signifier. I'm sitting there going, okay, dude, there's a lot more than the signifier uh, it, despite i mean it's of course that's important for lacan but there's some other things in there too than just him talking about the signifier um and then the stuff with hey look i think you says know, the guy uh, who's croaking uh, like a frog <laughs> you know i mean no wonder he doesn't like the signifier right well and that's the thing right because his libidinal materialism which we will save that for the course but this line of philosophy that Lan is positions himself as the, the latest member of. So it starts with Schopenhauer, it goes to Nietzsche, goes to Bataille, goes to Deleuze and Guattari, goes to Land, right? Um, okay, um, Fro Freud's in there if, okay, Freud of Beyond the Pleasure Principle is in this tradition too. Here's the spoiler, I guess. The point is of this tradition, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Freud, Bataille, Deleuze and Guattari, Land, they all have metaphysics or at least theoretical positions that that privilege some sort of impersonal force over the human will, over human desire, human volition, human identity, right? Schopenhauer has the will, Nietzsche has will the power or also uh, active reactive forces. Freud has death drive, Bataille has the sun or the accursed share. Um, D and G have the machinic unconscious or desiring production, and Land has all all of that basically in the form of of uh, the machinic unconscious and how he sees it relating to capital. Right. Um, so there there's this whole line, and Land is going to privilege these inhuman forces, these noumena, over the human and our world of phenomena. This is why he's, his great antagonist is the phenomenological tradition. He hates phenomenology. And even though we can sit here and go, well, Husserl and Hegel meant something different by it. Yeah, but there's enough of both of them privileging human experience. Okay, they do it in different ways. But this, this, this tradition from Hegel, starting with phenomenology of spirit, that runs up Husserl, Sartre, Heidegger, Merleau Ponty, Levy, all of them, right? Uh, Derrida, right? Even if there's Derrida is critical of it or blah, 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 it doesn't matter. There's this privileging of human experience in this tradition. And that's precisely what Land wants to deprivilege. And he thinks that the Schopenhauerian, Nietzschean, Freudian of 2000, or the, of the, I believe it's 1920, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Yeah, that's right. This line privileges bigger impersonal forces over us, over our experience. And that's what land is, wants to be part of is a, a tr philosophical trajectory of that sort. So we'll get into that in the course. Um, 
but the point with Hagel and here, here's the thing I want to say about Todd and everything, because we know uh, Todd is one of the great uh, Hegelian scholars, philosophers of our time. And it, Todd and Slavoj, despite their differences in, in little things, they're very much aligned in other ways. Here's why I think Land hates Hegel and Lacan, even if this isn't how he would say it. Because Hegel and Lacan undermine the absolute sharp dualism between phenomena and noumena. Exactly. This, uh, yes, exactly. And that's, that's what exactly. I was trying to get at, by the way. He hates dialectics. He opts for cybernetics over dialectics, right? Um, because dialectics involves this cross-pollination interfacing. And so he doesn't want to think like, oh, we also dialectically participate. In, the outside can impose itself on us, but we don't. We don't the interesting, the interesting thing here is that I think, and this is another, I think, important point to maybe explore in the course, is that with Hegel's dialectics, you do ultimately get to speculative cognition, but I feel like Hegel's dialectics enriches speculative cognition in, in a way that I think helps us think the real of the moment, as opposed to projecting into a future like a future space that doesn't exist yet, you know, like it's, 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 al it's almost, it's almost cheating to spec, like oh, I'm giving my own point of view too much, but it's cheating to, to, to speculate on, on the, on the, on the future in that sense, because you can say anything, at least that was my, I, but that, that was my experience in cybernetics. Like I, I was studying in cybernetics, evolutionary cyber. And to me, I switched to dialectics because to me, it gave a richer speculative cognition. Anyway, I gave too much, uh, um, but no, but I like that. I like that because that's this thing, this fundamental distinction for him is dialectics and cybernetics. And I think, I mean, I'm trying to work out that distinction in my own ways that are philosophically relevant here. But like you said, you could take it and run with it. I mean, there, there's so many different ways to try to explain what is this difference between cybernetics and dialectics. Um, but for, for Land, he sees a very sharp, important difference. But I think that's the point for, for Hegel. Identity is the identity of identity and difference, right? Which is to say the other is what partly constitutes my identity, but my identity constitutes the other. And yes, Todd especially is going to emphasize that this is internal, which means that every identity is internally bifurcated or antagonistic within itself. Um, but we can also, I mean, if we view it externally, that's, that's another thing. But um, point is, is that, that that would mean that the noumenon is extimate to the phenomena right and this this kind of dialectical contamination is what land wants to avoid. he's far more of a typical kantian dualist when it comes to these two he wants to maintain the radical otherness of the outside it's not just oh it's just outside for us no it, it's outside period and so that's that's part of what's at stake there now you you um you said one other thing I wanted to comment on before we wrap it up. What was one of your other reflective bullet points? I think the other main thing I was talking about was the the Nietzsche and the CCRU. Yeah, yeah. What what was the the Nietzsche the Nietzsche thing? Well, just thing? that that I like that you're emphasizing that Land as as a Nietzschean figure, but what Land did with the CCRU, Nietzsche was never able to. Nietzsche never made anything like a CCRU. He never made a research unit. He Wait, was very, that's right. Yeah. What was it? But there was another point that maybe the uh in terms of the theory underground stuff well there was i feel like i'm missing a point okay there was yeah we touched on the limitations um of 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 our cognition um well actually this is perfect because oh the I inhuman wanted... ah yeah 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 yeah. so the the inhuman thing okay um yeah i mean so for <laughs> us the the the, the thing is, we're inhuman in the sense that we have this thing called the unconscious, which fundamentally determines us, yet isn't reducible to our conscious identity and, in fact, contradicts it. But, um, uh, yeah, it, it is it's it's an inhuman that is not inhuman with a capital I from Land's perspective. Um, Land doesn't care about the personal unconscious. He doesn't he doesn't think it's relevant. He cares about the machinic unconscious, which he gets from D and G, but it's a misleading term 
what he's talking about are the natural processes of nature, the 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 productive forces of nature itself, right? And there's truth to it. The fact that is that our we as a species, we as individuals, we're naturally produced. Now, of course, there's this Lacanian thing. No, we're produced by the symbolic order and we have to get the dead signifier. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't deny the fact that, our, yes, our biological bodies were produced by biological, physical, natural processes. And for d &G and for land, they're machinic, which is to say it's parts that do certain things interacting with other parts that do other things that come together and form other parts. And it's this whole combinatory ontology of parts of things connecting with other parts of things, making other new things come into being right and it's this type of assemblage ontology um that is so important for for dng and land land too but he thinks that the machinic unconscious is this productive process in nature or the flows of these big impersonal forces whether intensities um all of all of the intensities and and forces at work in nature and they affect us subjectively. They, they affect our ability to... Look, here's the thing, right? We talked earlier about the heat of the sun. This is what makes... And we talk about Kant. Deleuze and Guattari have what they call transcendental empiricism. It also gets called transcendental materialism. And there's truth to this. This is something that I, I'm, I don't deny. This is just right. That the conditions of experience for Kant his whole point is that they're ideal, which is, his, his transcendentalism is ideal, uh, transcendental idealism. Okay. So the point is all of the fundamental structures of objects and of experience are imposed on sense data by the mind. So the, con the, the conditions of all possible experiences are structures and rules within our mind. Hence they're ideal. Okay while still not being a, a full-blown idealist because he maintains that sense data are given to us by things in themselves. There are objects giving us sense data. We don't do all of this on our own. It is a, a co-production between things in themselves giving sense data and then how our sensory apparatus goes to work on those on that data. So, um, but the point is for D and G, they start realizing like, yeah, 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 yeah. But our sense apparatus, our, our intelligibility is itself, this, this, this form of human experience, which is rooted in our bodies, there's still an intensive field that makes this possible, which is to say, the, the our sense organs are not possible if it's a thousand degrees colder or a thousand degrees hotter. You hear certain thresholds that our bodies no longer can function in right they die uh just based on the intensive fields we're in i mean this is deleuze's ontology of intensity how if you have a bag of popcorn kernels and you want popcorn how do you actualize the popcorn kernels uh, kernels uh into popcorn how do you pull those potentials into actuality put them in a microwave which is a field of intensity and under certain intensive rates it, it goes to work, it, it actualizes certain becomings, it pulls virtualities into actuality, and you get, they pop, and you get popcorn, right? Um, and the point is for, for D&G and for land, is that our very sense apparatus, our mental faculty, has its own conditions of possibility, right? What are the conditions of possibility of experience? They are external, they're in the empirical material field, because we're talking about rates of intensity um our, our our i mean for us specifically the earth's position relative to the sun right um all of these conditions make the emergence of the human body of or even biological experience period right it this this certain relative contingent distance that the earth has relative to the sun makes possible biological conscious experience right and so this idea that the conditions of experience are tucked away in our head d and g and land would go no there's much bigger forces at play when it comes to the possibility of experience and our mental faculty itself is conditioned in the empirical material field by 
the level of intensity, heat, pressure, all of the, these kind of uh, natural physical intensities. So, okay, that's that's that. Maybe I'll, I, I'll stop I'm there. I'm wondering, Cadell, um, since you you are taking this course, if you wanted to say a couple of things about what you're, like, you already kind of alluded to some of the stuff that you're thinking about, and you said that this is getting you excited. Um, but yeah, how does this tie into your own work with Global Brain Singularity? Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. I'm wondering, it, it, was could was land already relevant to you at the time of writing that, um, or is this kind of just like these things have not been brought together before for you? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I mean, I'm I'm ex I'm I'm excited to go into it because I, I was I, I, as I mentioned to to Mikey before we pressed the recording, I I read Fang Numina, but I read I read Land because of almost provocation from the the theorygram community because I just saw so many uh, memes about Land that I was like, okay, I've got to I've got to at least familiarize myself with this. Um, but no, in terms of in terms of global brain singularity. I mean, I was I was coming at uh, the technological singularity mostly inspired by Kurzweil's work, and Kurzweil is a much more utopian thinker than a dystopian thinker. But he ultimately comes to the same conclusion in a utopian sense that we're going to merge with technology and we're going to become like these immortal beings, or or at least beings that appear immortal or infinite from our current perspective. Um, and he sees this much more as a synergistic process, which is going to unfold. And, and he comes up with very specific prediction uh, timelines, which actually, if you look at his prediction timelines, they actually, you know, they 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 pan out a lot of the times. You know, they're, 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 they're quite accurate. Um, and he also participates in that very prediction timeline in the sense that he's actually working at Google, creating the software that he says is going to exist at a certain time. And all this type of stuff. Um, but I, I was coming at it from an evolution, but but where I'm interested in in learning more about Land's work from Mikey is um I was I was fundamentally influenced by the evolutionary cybernetic point of view. Um and and my my doctoral supervisor was a you know a world-class evolutionary cybernetician. He wasn't a philosopher. He wasn't a sort of charismatic dystopian in the way that Land was. He's he was much more a, a hard scientist um, than than it, than it, you know he was interested in modeling and he was interested in coming up with computer simulations of the global brain and stuff like this, you know. But in terms of my actual doctoral thesis, it's interesting. My doctoral thesis is structured in four parts, and the first three parts are evolutionary cybernetic informed. But then in the very research for those three sections, I came upon in my, this is my own uh, narrative, my own, uh, you know, experience is I, from my perspective, I came up on the limits of evolution, evolutionary cybernetic thinking in my actual PhD writing process. I was like, I can't think further with the evolutionary cybernetic point of view. I feel like I'm running up into a wall. And that's where I broke into dialectics. And that's where I broke into psychoanalysis because I needed dialectics and psychoanalysis to think through the problem that I had reached with the evolutionary cybernetic point of view. And that was precisely to actually include the human and to include the mind into these theories of, of, of singularity. Because what, what I, I mean, anyway, that, that's sort of the way I came at it. And, and I've been going along that path ever since is is i'm i'm interested in um thinking um about the human being and the human being's sort of interaction with all of these technological systems as opposed to imagining some sort of uh annihilation or a, 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 a being obliterated by these technological uh systems sort of i i came to think about the alternative, the imagining our annihilation, our, our eventual end, as a sort of a, a psychotic or a perverted uh, fantasy structure. Um, uh, psychotic because you're not really 
you're not really thinking the real of the moment. You're sort of getting lost in some sort of fan phantasmatic image and perverted in the sense that you're kind of getting some sort of weird enjoyment from our own extinction. So I thought it was much mm -hmm. more difficult. Anyway, so so these are the, the anyway, that gives a, a brief. Oh, that's overview. good. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. I, and that's right where Brian's coming into this as well. He was the, uh, remember, co-instructor for the, uh, idea of the university course of course and so yeah. he's he's this this stuff we've been doing with ccru and nick land as well as the stuff i've been doing um on a couple other things recently it has kind of coalesced with a, his own thinking and his turn towards a lot more future oriented work and so he's uh going for a dissertation now in uh ai and human subjectivity basically like you know, what is the line between human and, and artificial intelligence? And then what is what are the conditions of possibility for human subjectivity for it for a meaningful and good life? And uh can these things coexist? And if they have to, then how can how will we? You know, how I guess yeah, really I don't I don't view it in I don't view it in more I don't view it in moral terms like good or bad. I I I more view it as like an objective fact that artificial intelligence exists and these computer systems exist and 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 it's 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 much it's much more thing like in in some sense I'm actually I shouldn't say this but I'm working on something which is I'm I'm working on something which is basically um not let's say transgressing the anyway it doesn't doesn't matter to, to go in that direction but just basically to bring the categories of the good the true and the beautiful the platonic categories into rethinking uh, our current situation with artificial intelligence as opposed to imagining our disappearance basically Thanks, so Cadell, yeah. so Cadell, you don't want to be a a uh a Cthulhu in the future. You don't want to. Ah, no. Oh, so uh, it's interesting. I, I do, I do think, I, I do think we should. I do, I, I do think that we should, like what like underground theory is. I do think like what we're doing. We're outside of the institutions. We're not the CCRU, but I like this idea of the Cthulhu as a, t a type of underground monster. Like, and, and, and like, and we, we should, we should be like, we like, but not us as not like Cadell and Mikey and Dave, but like the totality of what we're doing as Cthulhu. This is an idea I've been playing with. Uh, lately. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it's, it's clearly I, for everyone watching. I it, it's, it's much past my normal bedtime. So I'm, I'm probably uh, spaced out right now. Let me, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. We'll wrap it up. Yeah, you yeah it's late but no, where Cadell is. But no, it's funny. Part of what, so the other, so Dave, I think was referencing that. And I, I like what you were doing, Cadell. Uh, what Dave has in mind is part of the future as land sees it is going to involve accelerated body modification. And that, I mean, Look, one of the points he makes in his the very controversial Dark Enlightenment essay book, whatever we want to call it, um, he's he's talking about because because Land is very clear that neo reaction is not fascist. He's not going to go for um this type of uh, privileging of one's identity like that, right? Because for him, he thinks the future is going to destroy all of our fixed identities as we know them right it's gonna rip through them deterritorialize them <clears throat> tear them to shreds and so he's he's fundamentally against fascism because as he sees it fascism is this this state project to maintain a certain status quo obviously if we're viewing it from jizekian lens there's typically a scapegoat figure that's blamed for the failures of that society why things are changing for the worse why that status quo the, that's the security of that status quo is under threat but for land he's just against the security of the status quo period and when he's talking to guys who are like wh white nationalist types you know this idea oh i want to preserve my and he would say this to black nationalists anybody who wants to preserve their race or whatever he would say oh you think you you're you're under threat now 
just wait. Um, as I think the famous quote is think face tentacles. Like he, he, he's to the point he thinks that will bioengineering and all of this stuff will make it where we literally can look like Cthulhu if we want to. Um, we can have right. wings, but we, you know, we'll do all this stuff. No, yeah. Let me just say, I, I just, I just watched, I just watched this video. I don't know if you guys watch this YouTube channel called soft white underbelly. If you don't just check it, it's it. He, this guy interviews crazy people, but he was interviewing some extreme body modification guy today uh, that I was I, I was watching today. Like he looked like Lord Voldemort. Really? He had, you know, he had his nose. His nose was gone. Is like a rep. He was trying to become a reptile. His nose was gone. His ears were cut off. He had horns coming out of his head everywhere. He like cut his tongue was cut in half. He was gonna cut off his dick, but like this type of extreme body modification is it, it it's already actual. But with the with the types of technologies that are gonna come online in the twenty first century, I mean, all bets are off. I mean, Isabel Millar's been talking about this too. I mean, the body wars, the culture wars are about the body, and it's gonna become intense. I think. Yeah, I mean, and so I mean, on top of this body modification. The uh, situation land thinks that ai at least in one point i think it's a meltdown he says that ai in any meaningful robust sense is going to start with basically sex bots right like what, what isabel's talking about that yeah um it's going to start there because i mean the the basic human desire you want to fucking make a commodity that'll sell that's it right we we've seen this in science fiction for a long time and uh, he thinks that it'll, you know, that's where it'll begin is making lifelike sex dolls. And then it'll exponentially grow f in intelligence from there. Um, all of these are, these are futures that we're, we're here living in, right? I mean, yeah. they're not to the point that land thought, but I mean, like you're talking about the body modification. I mean, it, it, that's pretty close to looking like Cthulhu. I mean, I understand like having, functional face tentacles is a next step but um since land is on this uh, the side of this future this is what makes him completely at all and that's why anybody who, who's on the right in any typical sense should absolutely despise land he's the the great anti-traditionalist he's the great anti uh he's anti-racist in the sense of he ultimately wants a pure deterritorialization which is to say a process of becoming that undoes all races all, all identities right and so if, if conservatives are typically thought of as people who want to preserve a certain way of life every way of life we have is going bye-bye according to land and that's this process he wants to accelerate so the reason Dave wanted me to mention sci-fi is because of this, right? We're, we're already living in this situation. It's not 50 years off. We're already in the, the slide, so to speak, uh, of, of this trajectory. And so I do think this is another thing land does provide us with is opportunities to think these situations, whether we agree or disagree, uh, he will inspire us to think something. And so I give that that's a merit on his part. Um, and so, look, as far as the course goes, yeah, I, I put together a list of movies and it was fairly long. But the, the essentials, the ones that were most important for land are Terminator, Terminator 2, precisely because they involve this this bootstrap paradox, which especially it, this idea of self-cause, right, which is another Fang Numina th situation here, because for Kant, tri obviously, typically causality works. One thing causes another. You don't self-cause. You don't auto-generate. Now, you get into biology and all the sophistications there. This gets more complicated than uh, Kant knew it to be, right, with cybernetics and all of that. But yeah. Kant didn't know that. So he's limiting causality to, like, you it, parents cause their children. Children aren't their own causes, right? It's this very basic abc level of causality and uh lands like no um he views he views causality in these cybernetically circular ways where you can't really say what part of the process or the loop is the beginning and what's the end it's a loop and so um 
Terminator involves this. So, okay, it's, I mean, we get it in part one where uh, John Connor sends his, his friend Kyle Reese back in time. Turns out that Kyle Reese ends up being his father. But the more the the, the, the more strict form of the bootstrap paradox or the self-cause is in part two, where we find out that the only reason that we end up having the capabilities to build Skynet is because Skynet itself sent a Terminator back in time and the arm, the, the, the remaining body of the first Terminator sent back in time in part one is what gave them the technological insights and knowledge on how to build AI. So that is a true self-cause of Skynet, right? It's, it's this loop. And so point is, um, Land refers to this mode of cybernetic retro causality as timplexity, which is his word for time anomalies, um, which he views in positive feedback loops, especially. Um, which, 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 which we'll get into. And so I'm going to just kind of, we'll, we'll get no, into hold on. Let me say a couple more movies. Just, okay. Fuck. If you're going to take the course, <laughs> here's the movies. Terminator 1, Terminator 2, watch Looper. Looper was important for Land. He talks about it in his, his essay, Timplexity. Watch a movie yeah. called Transcendence because Transcendence has all this stuff with body modification and nanotechs and artificial intelligence. A uh, lot of good stuff there. Um, yeah, um, Blade Runner, obviously, it, it, it had a huge impact. And, you know, we'll be posting the list on, on the site and we'll email and it's it. On, Those are some of the And it's words. on your Instagram. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so, and the structure of the course, just briefly, it's a four-week course. First week is going to be talking about this libidinal materialism tradition that Land situation situates himself in, which is to say Land's ontology. We've we talked on a lot of key points of it here, but we'll go into more detail there. The next week is going to be Land's uh, mature period, the, the 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 essays he's most known for, meltdown, all of that stuff, uh, which is his theory of capitalism from the nineties. Third week is going to be the neo-reactionary stuff, dark enlightenment. We're going to tackle that. And then the fourth week is going to be, which we haven't spoken about much here, is his whole thing with the occult. He gets into Aleister Crawley. He gets into chaos magic and all of this. And long story short, we're going to talk about some demon lemurs. <laughs> but uh, that that's the, the the four weeks in a nutshell. Yeah, man. Um, and it's Saturdays, 5 p.m. Eastern. And yeah, it starts October 28th. I have a whole axe to grind and line of analysis and interpretation and thing that I've kind of got in my back pocket. I won't touch on it here. Just uh, know there's a lot. There's a lot that's going to go into this four weeks. And it really lays the basis for a bunch of really cool shit we're doing next year, including at our conference that we'll have um, a call for proposals towards an anthology on human futures. So this is kind of ground zero for the human futures anthology. So get on it. Fantastic. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, all links uh, to everything we've discussed today will be in the description. Links to Theory Underground, Nick Land Course, um whatever else uh i need to need to link uh it, it, it'll be it'll be down there um i guess uh any 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 final any final plug mikey for the uh, like like you said october 28th four week course going into the 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 basics of land the ccru and even the occult shit uh yeah just any any final thought and then we'll we'll close I guess, up i guess i'll just say that there are many leftists who act like nick land is a philosopher we should all be afraid of and at theory underground we ain't afraid of no land uh we have no problem speaking his name or we're talking about his philosophy we're not going to treat him as he who shall not be named uh we're not going to do the the voldemort thing um or the candy man thing right we're not afraid of his name we're not af afraid of his ideas uh we, we want to reckon with them. We want to know what he's about. We want to have that understanding. And so I guess in what, in Candyman, Nick Land, Nick Land, Nick Land, Nick Land, Nick Land, like 
Let's go. All right. And Dave, any 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 final thoughts related to Theory Underground? Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of fellow travelers who are into speculative realism. Uh and a lot of them are just reading left accelerationists, but it's kind of like reading Derrida and Levinas. You don't know what the fuck you're reading if you don't know Heidegger, because they are left Heideggerians. And you don't know what a left accelerationist is if you don't know Nick Land. So don't be a dumb dumb. Get in here. Let's do it. I'm excited. All right. Perfect way to end. Thank you so much, Mikey and Dave. For everyone else, you've been watching the whole time. Links in the description. Nick Lang course starts October 28th. I'll be there. And uh, thanks for watching. In this conversation, I discussed with Michael Downs and David McCarricker about the upcoming course at Theory Underground focused on Nick Land. We dove into some of the reasons behind the launch of the course, as well as explored some of the core ideas behind Land's philosophy, including the idea of accelerationism, the meaning of Thang Numina, and some of the philosophical dynamics unique to Land's cybernetic culture research unit. I am personally enrolled in the upcoming course and highly recommend the work at Theory Underground. If you're interested in joining, the course starts October 28th. Links in the description. Also, this philosophical conversation series is only the surface of Philosophy Portal. Behind the scenes at philosophyportal.online, there is a portal into the world of philosophy. So far, we have explored the works of Hegel, Nietzsche, Freud, Lacan, and Zupancic. If you are interested, new to philosophy, looking to deepen your knowledge, or need something that will complement your doctoral or professional studies in philosophy, Philosophy Portal is a great place to start. We host conferences, produce anthologies, and are looking to expand our services in 2024. If you want to help Philosophy Portal grow, you can help out by becoming a supporter on Patreon or a paid subscriber on Substract. Links in the description. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Michael Downs and David McCarricker.